This is going to be very different. Most of the speakers that have addressed uh, sensory processing so far have talked about content, right? Uh, and particularly uh, Peter's uh, excellent talk was about the content of vision. Now what I'm really going to talk about is more like the context, if you will. And uh, uh, maybe the easiest way to uh, go there, there is to go right to the punchline again, and that is uh, that it's going to be about neuronal oscillations. And uh, according to uh, Jerry Bujaki, who the uh, trainees and postdocs in, in my lab call Elvis, uh, the, the oscillations are, provide the context for the content of processing, right? So kind of keep that idea in mind as we go forward here. Maybe that'll help. Uh, I'll try to keep it clear. OK, so there's a lot of rhythm in the world. Uh, the world is, you could say, lousy with rhythm. Uh, there are a lot of uh, things in the physical world that are rhythmic, uh, that, that, that have these kind of quantized wave-like properties, uh, particularly when you get to biologically generated uh, stimuli. Now we're really talking rhythmic. These are things that are generated by motor systems, uh, and to some extent there is a rhythm in almost every bit. Even an isolated movement has a very uh, rapid kind of rotational rhythm to it. Even an isolated movement has that. But very often what we're doing is walking, doing things that are ex incredibly rhythmic. Uh, vo vocalizations, music, these are other examples. Uh, so uh, these rhythmic event streams, especially, uh, I, I, again, take conversation as an example. Uh, these, are, uh, they, these have strong rhythms to them such that if you go along with somebody for a little while in a conversation, you find yourself finishing the sentences for them if they pause. Like people in the south of the United States when they come to New York, all the New Yorkers finish their sentences for them because they speak too slowly, right? And, and they're able to do that because they use that ongoing event stream, that rhythm, as a context and as a prediction. Right? So they know what's going to happen. They, they know a lot about the content, too, but the, content, the, the temporal part's the easy part, so I'm going to stick with that mostly. Okay, so you have the outside rhythms, now you have the inside rhythms. Now, uh, internal rhythms, these neuronal oscillations, uh, there are all kinds of events in the, in the nervous system. A lot of them really aren't oscillatory, right? but a, a lot of them are. And uh, I don't want to get into a big argument about that at the moment, maybe we could do that later. Um, but the simplest thing about these uh, oscillations is that they're a rhythmic shifting of excitability in some ensemble of neurons, right? And so in a, in a real simple world, uh, if, if you go into what would be the high excitability phase, this kind of pink area here, uh, that neuron is more likely to fire. In fact, it'll fire spontaneously when it's in its high phase. Uh, maybe not as much as you see it doing there. This is a little bit of an artistic uh, uh, license. But then when it goes into the low excitability phase, it's much less likely to fire. So if inputs come in here during the high excitability phase, they're more likely to be enhanced, actually amplified, or suppressed in that phase. So you can see right away how this could do work in the brain, right? Okay, now what causes these neurons to do this and to synchronize together is a million dollar question. And I'm not going to really talk about that. We're very interested in that. There's some really excellent work I can steer you to on that that uh, is only a tiny bit of that's in my lab. There's some really excellent work outside uh, in other labs doing that. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is uh, oscillation as a neural substrate for context and prediction. Now, the idea of active sensing is very much like predictive coding. It's identical in most ways. The, the difference is, is that active sensing takes advantage of the fact that you're very often using a motor sampling routine. Uh, so for example, whisking and sniffing in rats, those rhythmic motor activities put rhythm into the system, right? And they happen to be sniffing at theta, which is the fa favorite uh, uh, frequency for uh, rat people. Uh, Saccadic sampling in humans, uh, it's not always rhythmic, but often very rhythmic, and it runs between three and five hertz. Again, that puts a rhythm into the machine, right? It, 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 it parses the visual scene and makes the, uh, the stream rhythmic. Uh, 
And uh, I, I, I won't go through all the reasons why we think this, uh, but there's a lot of good reasons to believe that covert attentional sampling is about as rhythmic as overt visual search sampling. Uh, and that's what I'm gonna be talking about now. So, um, here's a bit on methods. Now, I, I'll go through this very quickly because uh, Peter did a great job. Here's the schematic of the electrode and there's a kind of a, a canonical circuit here. And, and you know, the reason you'd wanna record all the, all the different layers is because we know different input types uh, target layers differently. The, the simplest is, of course, the feed forward, which tends to go into layer four, and, and feedback, which tends to exclude layer four, and, and Peter did a great job showing that. So, uh, and of course, these electrodes now, uh, uh, we're using the same kinds, uh, are, in, include uh, the capability of doing pharmacology, I won't talk about that, and electrical stimulation, and I had to throw those slides out this morning because I realized it was still too long. So. Uh, I won't talk about that either, but we can talk about that privately if you're interested. So to give you an idea of what we'll do, we'll put in, generally speaking nowadays, we'll put two or three in for an experiment, and we aim them into places that we think are talking to each other, so we can look not just at one column of processing, but the interaction between different areas. And again, uh, thanks to Peter and several of the others earlier for, for covering this, this issue. In one location, what you can see is we'll record a laminar profile of, of these field potentials. These are, in this case, auditory event-related potentials averaged over about 50 trials to a simple auditory stimulus. And what you can see is that there's a lot of laminar voltage gradient. If you apply a formal uh, laminar voltage gradient analysis, this, this second derivative or current source density analysis, you arrive at this plot of current sinks uh, in red and sources in blue. And as Peter mentioned earlier, they, they, generally, uh, they generally balance out so circuits are completed. Uh, what's nice about this is this happens to be an auditory cortex. Oh, by the way, you're also recording the multi-unit activity or even sometimes single unit activity from all these contacts. I'll show you just a couple uh, of cases, one in layer four and one in the superficial layers. Again, you see that initial uh, very fast response in layer four depolarization of those granule cells followed by a later depolarization at some lag of the upper layers. And I'm not, I'm not really showing what's going on in the lower layers here. But it's typically a very similar profile to the ones that you see in uh, S1 or V1. Now what's nice about this is first of all, this relates in, in a very straightforward way to EEG and MEG, right? So this uh, field potential here with a three-fifths rule corresponds beautifully to an auditory ERP in a human. This P30 is a P50, there's an N1, N2, and so forth. So just doing this gives you some index of what those components mean in humans. Uh, and of course, more and more we're learning that specific parts of this spectrum of signal are contributing to fMRI, and so that's of interest as well. What, what, what this does give you uh, in, in all these cases is an index of the cellular population. So we're looking at a, 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 a configuration, a current flow configuration that's characteristic of pyramidal cells here, right? Another that's, uh, that's uh, characteristic of granule cells in layer four. So we, we have a good idea of what the cell populations are and what the neuronal processes are. Uh, uh, usually, uh, these current sinks are the active elements, but there are many cases we can document where the Current source is the active element, active hyperpolarization with sinks providing current return. And the multi-unit activity helps you sort that out. Here's uh, a, a, a similar plot. Uh, actually, this is the newer electrode with uh, 24 contacts at 100 uh, micron spacing. This, uh, the difference is, is that this is uh, just a single trial of activity, 1500 milliseconds long. And what I just showed you applies in principle and in practice to the single trial. What you're looking at up here is a theta oscillation. Yeah, I've got the artist rendition of it there. So that, uh, that positive negative alternation you're seeing there is just that alternation of current source and sink in the superficial layers. If you have an eye for these things, you can also see this uh, underlying delta oscillation and you, can, and you can even see phase amplitude coupling. So the amplitude of the theta oscillation is higher at this phase of the delta oscillation than at this phase. 
And for the, uh, for the people that are after the real truth, oops, there's the gamma oscillation. Okay, uh, this is a, a spectrum of this activity here, uh, which, which just simply quantifies it. It's a wavelet spectrum. It shows these peaks uh, uh, corresponding to the source sink lo locations in the superficial layers for uh, delta, theta, and gamma. That's 1 to 4 hertz, 5 to 7, and 30 to 50. There's also uh, peaks for the same frequencies here in layer 4 and down in this in infragranular layers. It's not that nothing is going on there. It's just that this, the gain of this display is set by the brightest features here. This is uh, simply quantification of a large sample of data in a number of monkeys to show you that the profile I'm, I'm showing over here is representative. This is from auditory cortex. Uh, we've got really uh, very, very much consistent results uh, that go along with this for resting activity in visual cortex and somatosensory and motor cortex. Here's a, a, an animation just to give you a, a better feel for the dynamics, and I want to make uh, I want to make a point with this, but, but it's, it's also nice just to see what the experiments look like online. So these are the laminar profile of ERPs overlaid in color. So you can see that uh, laminar voltage gradient very nicely this way. And this is the activity from layer four, just from layer four, multi-unit activity that's rectified. Uh, so upward deflection means increase in activity. Now what I'm going to do, uh, oh, this is from primary auditory cortex. And this is from superior temporal polysensory area, which is a, a multisensory region that gets some auditory input. The stimulus here is the best frequency tone, 100 milliseconds long for this site. And uh, what, what I'd like you to notice is, A, there's a lot of variability here, right? Trial to trial. B, the variability is quite a lot more in the higher order region than it is in the lower. And you can see that pretty easily with your eye. So there's a nice, pretty regular response to this best frequency tone. Um, you know, if you, if you average just a few trials together, you've got, the, you've got it, right? If you care about the average. Uh, look how much more variable it is up here. It's really incredible. Now the deal is, is that this particular uh, uh, experiment was done in, an, in a monkey that didn't care about the stimuli at all. It, it was just sitting there. Uh, it wasn't asleep. We, make, uh, we take trouble to keep him awake. But that is a really, really noisy situation. And the deal is, is that these low frequency, high amplitude, low frequency oscillations are a big noise problem if they're not constrained. So what we want to do now is have a, a, a paradigm that will do this. And we've used this particular paradigm in a bunch of different uh, evolutions uh, uh, over the years. Uh, this is called the intermodal selection or streaming paradigm. It's a series of beeps and flashes that are highly jittered uh, they have a mean uh, within stream here of 650 milliseconds, but there's a great deal of jitter. So if you actually listen to this stream, it sounds chaotic. It really doesn't sound like it's alternating. It's difficult to, to determine that. But uh, fortunately, the brain figures this out. Otherwise, I wouldn't be talking about it. So our prediction is going to be that the brain, when you, oh, I'm sorry. The other thing that uh, I'll mention is that we cue the monkey to attend to, say, the visual stream and to look for oddball stimuli in that stream. They're difficult uh, to detect, and they occur randomly uh, on, on average about 15% uh, of the trials. Uh, and then in, in the alternate set of trials, we'll, we'll cue the monkey to the auditory stream. So this would be beep, 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 boop. And the boop would be the target. The monkey would release a switch and get a, a, get a bit of juice. Eye position is controlled in both cases. Okay, now our prediction is that the system, the brain, will line up an oscillation at the appropriate frequency to the attended stream so that uh, the high excitability phase corresponds to the events in the stream. And when you switch to attending to the other stream, it'll just switch over. So what you'll get is, if you compare across these conditions, you'll get phase opposition or counter entrainment. And uh, now I'm gonna show you how that looks in, in real life. It's a bit more complicated. This is a a long CSD plot going from 800 milliseconds minus, that is prior to a visual uh, onset, and it's the same in both. Uh, everything in this display is, is phase locked to the onset of the visual stimulus, okay? So it's true here and over here in B, 
The only difference is in this case it's attended and in this case it's ignored. Now it's, it's harder to see the uh, laminar onset profile here, so I won't try to push that point with you, but if maybe you'll take my word for it that if you measure it carefully, onsets are shorter uh, in the, the thalamal recipient layers than they are in the superficial layers. And uh, what you notice also here is that there's a nice attention effect. It's, it's a bit trivial at this point because a lot of people have shown this in V1, but the response is larger uh, when the visual stimulus is attended than when it's ignored. The other thing to note is that in the attend visual condition, the cortex is already rolling in the right direction. You see these, this current sink is already a current sink. There's a brief interruption when the stimulus comes up from layer four, but in the case of attend auditory, it's actually leaning in the wrong direction. So that's the phase opposition we were talking about. If you look at the earlier uh, uh, cases here, the, the earlier trials in this sequence, you can see that phase opposition. And what I've done here is just take the linear representation of the CSD and overlaid it just so you can see that clearly. So this, uh, this piece of cortex has obviously read our papers and knows what to do. And, uh, and, it's, and it's actually it's pretty straightforward. The same kind of uh, uh, phase opposition is seen in the inferior, in the infragranular layers. Again, these are the targets of these feedback uh, afferents. But what's interesting also is that the middle layers of the cortex, the ones that are receiving direct, directly from the thalamus, the inputs, uh, don't show that phase opposition. They're showing some amplitude modulation, uh, but not phase uh, uh, opposition. So the evoked response, if you want to put it in your uh, in predictive coding terms, uh, that's the evidence. That's the bottom-up evidence, right? Uh, that's occurring in the granular layers, and the granular layers are slave to the input. This is visual cortex. The entrained activity that we're seeing here is actually pretty clearly not simply an evoked response. There's an evoked response superimposed on it, but it's in the context of that entrainment. And that's really the top-down prediction, the system's prediction about what's going on. And it, you can see it very strongly in the superficial layers and a little bit more weakly, but, but, but still significantly in the inferior layers. Now, as a result of uh, phase, uh, of, of this, this, this type of phase uh, modulation, the system can use phase coherence to advance the input and, and, the, and the throughput of information through uh, this system, and uh, as, as we know, the superficial layers of cortex tend to project up to higher order regions. So this is actually sending the information up the system. At, at the same time, it can use phase uh, opposition to interfere with the passage of information through V1 and its, and its subsequent transmission up to higher order regions. Now one bad thing that we, one bad decision we made with this uh, experiment was that we didn't put these stimuli at threshold. And I think that would have been a much better idea because we probably would have choked off the flow of information utterly. These are very bright. And uh, yeah, it was a, a bad choice, but it, it, it worked out anyways. Uh, so the predictions align phases, uh, facilitating this interlaminar and interaerial uh, uh, transmission of information. We have parallel uh, recordings from V1, V2, and V1, V4 which, uh, which, which indicate that that coherence is increased, and I'm not going to have time to show that to you. Okay, as you would imagine, these entraining areas ought to form networks. This really should work across areas, and so the question is whether that's true or not. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to go to an ECOG experiment, intracranial recordings in epilepsy patients, much like the ones that were discussed earlier by two speakers, uh, and uh, we're going to use exactly the same paradigm, the same predictions, everything the same, and record, uh, I think we had uh, seven patients in this study. Now there were two kinds, this is the electrode coverage. There's no real signal here other than uh, we collapsed all the electrodes onto one hemisphere to just give you an idea of what kind of coverage of the brain we had. There are two main types of effect in the, uh, that we get here, and it's, this is reminiscent of the V1 findings in the monkey. Uh, the first kind is this beautiful phase opposition. So th there are the raw data. These are bandpass versions that make it easier to see. Uh, these are polar plots. Uh, essentially what these are are uh, auditory, these, these are uh, 
responses phase locked to the auditory stimulus when attended versus ignored. So that comparison is identical to the one I just described to you. Notably, in these uh, phase locking value uh, plots, these, these describe phase similarity within frequency across trials, which would tell you about entrainment. You see this beautiful phase locking at the delivery rate. So there's the entrainment. And this site doesn't really show anything else that we can detect. That contrasts, this type of uh, uh, entrainment site contrasts with an evoked response site. You can see these evoked responses with your eye in the, in the raw data. They're very clear. And in the bandpass data. What that means, what that ends up doing is giving you this kind of contaminated phase plot because it's thrown all this energy in there and it's all phase concentrated around the onset of the response. You still get uh, a significant phase modulation uh, uh, in these plots, but it's, uh, it's much less than the other cases. In addition, you can see this very broad spectrum phase locking that, that's characteristic of evoked responses. This actually goes up into the high gamma range in most cases. Uh, okay, so you have those two kinds of responses. They group in this way, in an interesting way, I would say. Here's the, uh, this uh, angular gyrus, perhaps uh, some of it in the TPJ region. In this, in this plot, the, uh, the, the, the dots are coded by the size of the phase opposition. So these big, bright red dots are, are uh, ones that show a very strong phase opposition. You see sur superior parietal cortex, particularly uh, a motor and premotor cortex, and then several orbitofrontal regions, as well as some midline structures. The evoked responses tend to occur near primary or near auditor, classic auditory and visual cortices. So again, those, those same two kinds of things that mean something quite similar to what we saw in the monkey. Okay, so the, there does seem to be evidence they act as a network, and I really didn't go through that in, in great detail. Uh, there are other things that I'd like to show you about that at some point. Um, how well do these entrainment effects generalize? So this is kind of a bizarre paradigm. It's forced alternation, flashes and beeps, and you know, what does that mean? Well, there's an auditory streaming literature that's extensive. Uh, here's one case where you have two streams. One of them is low, low beeps at a slow rate, boop, boop, boop. And then the other stream is beep, 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 beep. So higher pitch and faster rate. If you put these together, they do something really interesting. First of all, there's no temporal relationship between these things, so they kind of drift in and out of phase over trials, right? It gives you a lot of really interesting things to look at. Now, if you do this in primary auditory cortex in a monkey, uh, as we've shown, uh, this is a study by Peter Lakatosh uh, last year, uh, the cortex entrains at the rate of the attended stream, not at the rate of the ignored stream. It doesn't represent both in primary auditory cortex. It, it, the cortex as a whole seems to go to the rate of the attended stream. Interestingly, there is no phase opposition here, not, not that we can detect in uh, primary auditory cortex. But when we implemented this same type of paradigm in humans, you get phase opposition. Now remember, there's no, there's no real temporal relationship between these streams, so that phase opposition means that the brain is actually forming a template of the unattended stream and it's doing some kind of engineering application here like an active cancellation, maybe. That's a lot to guess from this, but we, we see this evidence pretty clearly here. This is a preliminary recording from a premotor cortex in a monkey in a very similar, in exactly the same uh, temporal paradigm and you see this very nicely. This is, uh, 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 this particular uh, case here is the response to a visual stimulus when it's attended versus ignored. And you can see that not only is there amplitude modulation, but this clear phase opposition. And this just shows you the, the, the occurrence of the stimuli in the unattended stream here. So you, you really see that they, they're just, they're just dr drifting along. There's no real relationship there. So this is an interesting response uh, that I, I can't say I expected to see, but I'm thrilled to see something new and different. Okay, we, we took a, a stab at doing the cocktail party uh, with a, a cadre of, uh, of uh, ECOG patients. And what we did was uh, played them long sentences. They faced two monitors. 
a man speaking and a woman speaking at the same time, each telling a complicated story that lasted about 10 seconds. And what the, the subject was to do in one set of trials was pay attention to the man, next set of trials pay attention to the woman. Uh, to make the long story short, the brain followed the attended stimulus. And maybe that's kind of an old story by now, but. It's kind of amazing to see it yet again, especially with a complicated paradigm like this. So we saw, again, these kind of suspicious by now two forms. We saw tracking of both, in other words, representation of both streams with enhancement of the attended in these places near auditory cortex. So you see that's what we're seeing here. Uh, oh, by the way, these are also temporal response functions that are kind of uh, derived from Jack Gallant's work, uh, ultimately. Uh, and they're basically telling us how well the brain signal is tracking the speech envelope, okay? You see this, this kind of effect both in the low frequency uh, activity, but you also see it in this uh, high gamma response. And, and just to, uh, to remind you, high gamma is thought generally to reflect something related to multi-unit activity. So that would be neuronal firing actually. Uh, that's, it's probably quite a bit more complicated than that. In addition, we saw something really kind of neat. We saw, in addition to this, uh, this kind of uh, uh, modulated tracking of attended and ignored, we saw what we think is, is in indicating selective tracking of the attended. And I'll say that cautiously. I'll say there's no detectable, uh, uh, with our methods, no detectable tracking of the ignored. So this, this could be perhaps an exclusive a representation of the attended uh, stimulus that would be beyond the perceptual bottleneck. And that tends to occur, uh, it's not isolated to these regions, but it tends to occur away from uh, these, uh, these classic auditory regions along the sylvia and sulcus. Okay, so what's neat about this, there's a bunch of neat implications, but one of them is, is that there's kind of a mechanistic relationship between low frequency phase and high frequency power. And that's been pretty well uh, plumbed in, in basic studies, and we'd like to go forward and manipulate that a bit. Okay, uh, is this modulation of an ambient rhythm or an evoked response? If, if I'm telling you it's entrainment and it's just evoked responses, it's a lot less interesting. So how can I be sure of that? Well, one of them is kind of qualitatively. I went through this before. This looks like entrainment, this business over here. There's, there's, uh, there's uh, phase locking at the presentation rate, and there's none of that broad high frequency. So that's sort of a null hypothesis uh, problem, but at least circumstantially, it's pretty good. Now back to the Lakatosh study. What we did here was we had the monkey paying attention, and we stopped the stimulus. And I didn't go into that before, but that's the last stimulus there at time zero, and what you see now is that the cortex continues, right? It is still oscillating at that rate and not that rate. And then in the other condition, the same thing happens. It, it, it continues to oscillate at the rate that it was. So, so now there's no possibility that this is an evoked response. It, it's possible you could argue that over here, but you really can't argue that here because there's nothing going on. So this is really the brain's prediction. This is the brain making it up. Okay, uh, do these, last thing I'll go into is do these effects connect to the infraslow scale. Now this is something I'm, I'm pretty excited about because uh, it's pulling me into the, into the realm of, uh, of uh, resting state uh, MRI. Uh, what we did was, as uh, we, we actually started doing some resting state functional imaging in monkeys uh, uh, with a lot of help from colleagues. And uh, w our intention is to look at the electrophysiology of these effects uh, using some of the techniques I've described. Now what we did as a kind of a preliminary step in this direction was go back into the data of these monkeys from these attention experiments and just look at uh, things like reaction time over a long scale. So here's uh, 400 seconds worth of data, many minutes. And what the monkey is doing is this, uh, this oddball detection task. Now we, we, we looked in, in this case at only the visual uh, side, not the auditory side, because we wanted to keep it simple. And we looked at cases where the behavior was near perfect. Still, if you look at this, the reaction time, we've noticed this and wondered about it for years, the reaction time varies 200 milliseconds here. It's ba basically 100 milliseconds on either side of a mean of about 500. And if you don't look at it 
kind of in the long time series, it just looks like random variability, but what you can see here is that it's actually traveling. It's going up and down slowly, right? And so what we did was, was uh, decomposed a whole lot of these time series and, uh, and then picked out the, uh, the significant time points using a, a shuffling procedure. And, they, and it lines up like this. So the different colors are different monkeys, uh, but this is, th these are all experiments uh, from these two monkeys, uh, uh, Vettier and Beldar. Uh, the example run is, is shown up here. So that, that has a peak. Uh, it's actually just, uh, just near the Nyquist frequency for this, uh, for this which happened to be uh, the average responses uh, were occurring at about six second intervals. And you, you can see these, these different groupings of activity. So, so it does look like the behavior is actually tracking something at a very slow rate. Now whether this corresponds to uh, you know, hemodynamic fluctuations is yet another question. It does seem to correlate really interestingly uh, with multi-unit activity. If you just do it for this example right here, so this is really just uh, uh, anecdotal, if you will, but what you do see is a very strong positive correlation. Now, I would have expected a negative correlation because I thought, I would have thought, when reaction time was slow, that would mean that the system was somnolent, like a lot of people feel right now, and uh, that uh, that firing would be low at that point, but that doesn't seem to be the case. Now, additional experiments we're doing looking at eye tracking and looking at pupillary diameter show that when the uh, when the firing rate is high, pupillary diameter is low, is small, right? So it's it, it kind of, it's counterintuitive. And, and, and I don't, I have some ideas, but I don't know quite what to make of it. I'm open to suggestions. Okay, so to summarize, open questions and experiments. What I'd like to encourage everybody to do is look at key rhythmic components of everything they're doing. Natural experience and behavior being one thing, uh, but also the experiments that we're doing often have cadences. Uh, I, I, looked at, I, I look at ERP paradigms, and they work out these paradigms to give good effects, and it turns out there's nearly all, always some real cadence to these things, and the brain seems to like that, and subjects work better that way. So look at those things, and, and that way you're not going to be slave to variability that you're not controlling. If you're controlling it, you'll be in charge. Uh, so I think that coordinating, uh, our data would show that coordinating activity across ensembles via these uh, low and even maybe very low frequencies uh, uh, is part of the scaffold, the context for the processing of content, inf information coding specifically. It also may be telling us that there is really a, brain's, uh, a brain sampling rate. And I wouldn't say that there's one sampling rate. I would say it's probably very context dependent. Uh, in, in other words, it always depends. Uh, there's also this interesting literature that, uh, that Peter uh, made uh, reference to earlier, and that is uh, to uh, you know, driving and uh, modulatory context. Well, that same literature, that thalamic uh, literature, talks about different modes, these tonic and bursting modes. And if you connect the dots all the way up to the faster uh, range uh, uh, oscillations, that implies that there, there may be some uh, tonic bursting shifting occurring even in, in one cycle of an oscillation. And those would be worth, uh, worth talking about then. Um, the precise physiological bases of these, of these oscillations is still unknown. Uh, there are a lot of good theories out there, but uh, I mean, it's still a wide open question from my perspective, and I'd like to know more about that. And it's also pretty clear that some uh, neuropsychiatric and sensory disorders have disorders of brain dynamics, and so it would be useful to find out more about that. Here are my acknowledgments. Uh, this is Peter Lakatos, who was central in many of these experiments. Uh, Ninka van Aardewelt, uh, who is uh, formerly from Maastricht and now uh, up in, at NIN. Alana Zayn Golumbic was first author on several of the ECOG studies, as was Julian Bell, uh, Lucia Maloney, uh, uh, Yoshi Kajikawa, Noel O'Connell, uh, Saskia Hagens, also from uh, Holland, uh, uh, and Chao Gan Yan actually is the guy that's doing the new, uh, uh, the newer work in uh, slow activity. Gabriela Mushakia, Jose Herraro, uh, 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 Jordi Costa Fadela, Annie Barjak. These guys are doing uh, anatomy. Uh, uh, Troy Hackett at Vanderbilt and John Smiley at our group, and Arno Fal Arno Falchier from our group. They are. Uh, we didn't talk about any of that work, but it's this is all coupled to anatomy work. 
Uh, thank you very much.